Today, together with the French presidency of the EU, European Commission, Eurojust, and the Genocide Network, we mark the seventh edition and seventh marking of the EU Day Against Impunity for Genocide, Crimes Against Humanity, and War Crimes. Unlike past years, which took place uh, due to the events um, in the form of a video, today we mark the event in a bit lively form, in a form of a webinar. And the topic of the event is on the front line of justice, preparedness of the EU and member states in fighting impunity for core international crimes. I think the topic is very much interesting because it will look into how the EU, what the EU, which measures took um, in and the national and the member states, which measures did they take um, in the past years, and how ready we are to address um, the, the accountability in the situations like Syria, Belarus, and the most recent one in Ukraine. Um, I would like at this opening to also mention that on this occasion, the Genocide Network Secretariat, together with the network, published two publications. One is the fact sheet on um, key factors for success on national level, and the other one is the overview of the national measures on the EU measures um, in respect of the implementation of the strategy um, from 2014. But first, I would like to welcome Mr. Ladislav Hamran, President of Eurojust, to devote the welcoming remarks. Please, Ladislav, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mateusz. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good uh, afternoon uh, to you all uh, from uh, The Hague. And I'm uh, very happy uh, and uh, grateful that you have uh, found the time to join us. And in fact, uh, as I checked, uh, more than uh, 300 persons registered for this event, which I think uh, demonstrates the need for and, uh, and the, the credibility of uh, this uh, initiative. In that respect, I wish to highlight uh, the role and the importance uh, of the Genocide Network Secretariat, which we so proudly host uh, here at uh, Eurojust. And I also want to address a special word of gratitude uh, to Mateusz uh, and uh, his uh, team, uh, as uh, I see uh, him and the Genocide Network Secretariat as the driving force uh, behind it. Rest assured, uh, your work doesn't go unnoticed and uh, it does create an impact. And uh, I do believe uh, that uh, this uh, has been illustrated, uh, unfortunately, also in the context of the ongoing uh, armed conflict in uh, Ukraine. It has uh, brought the horrors and uh, memories uh, from our past once again to the European uh, continent. But I believe that uh, this uh, conflict and the judicial uh, dimension of the EU response uh, to it uh, also offer an, op an opportunity and to all of us uh, that we should, uh, we should not simply miss. It uh, urged us to double down on our previous efforts uh, to get justice done uh, in uh, the face of uh, the core international crimes whenever they have been uh, committed. And I think that we have seen encouraging development in this uh, respect in recent uh, years. We can, uh, for instance, think of uh, rising staffing levels in many member states, war crimes units, ever since uh, the Russian Federation aggression in 2014, uh, when it took Crimea and started claiming the Donbas region. And further afield from the Syrian war theater, uh, there is, of course, the landmark Koblenz judgment uh, from January this year, which was the first time worldwide that a high-ranking Syrian official was uh, convicted for crimes against humanity. What we have uh, seen there is uh, that information uh, was uh, successfully translated into admissible uh, evidence before court, and this is uh, no uh, small feat. Uh, since uh, uh, courts and judges, for good reasons, evaluate the chain of uh, custody in order to assess the reliability and uh, validity of uh, evidence. And th this uh, leads me uh, with the Caesar files in mind that in no small part led to the Koblen judgment to also emphasize the role uh, of uh, the NGOs can play in documenting core international crimes 
and thus helping uh, to get justice uh, done. It would lead too far to single out any NGO in particular, but uh, I think that it's fair to say that uh, their level of professionalism has vastly improved across the, the board and uh, that they are valid counterparts for prosecutors and investigators, and uh, therefore we uh, owe them a debt of uh, gratitude. Dear colleagues, uh, dear uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, thinking of a global dimension of uh, atrocity crimes, these opening words would not be complete without highlighting the renewed cooperation which we have witnessed in recent weeks and months with the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court. From our perspective, we see a trend that our response to core international crimes is uh, growing more focused, and I wish to take this occasion to thank our colleagues uh, from uh, the ICC for their innovative approach towards partnership and their continued commitment. So in conclusion, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, let me finish by saying that the scale uh, of the challenge is by no standards getting smaller. But the same goes for the collective effort that we are building and that offer room for hope. Thank you uh, very much for your attention and I, hold and I hand over the floor uh, back to Mateusz. Thank you so much. Many thanks for your uh, welcome remarks and also outlining uh, the major challenges we face uh, these days in respect of situation in Ukraine. I'm sure that this uh, notion will come back to us also later on um, in, the, in the panel discussion. Um, our next two high-level presenters are Mr. Didier Reynolds, EU Commissioner for Justice, and His Excellency Louise Vossi, French Ambassador to the Netherlands. However, Mr. Reynolds was not able to join us at this very moment, so he is sending to us a video message. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and pleasure for me to address you once more on this important day. Considering the current situation, we must recognize that peace in Europe cannot be taken for granted. Thoughts of the past, when millions of European citizens were killed or fled their homes, come flooding back. Then, it was our own grandparents and parents we were forced to look for shelter in cellars or bunkers. With war, often come war crimes. In the last decades, Europe has made important progress with regards to prosecuting core international crimes. Luckily, prosecutions for war crimes or crimes against humanity are not the standard, but national judicial systems are today ready for it in case. This is important. If we don't prosecute genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes, perpetrators of such heinous crimes can live their lives with impunity. But these crimes violate the most fundamental laws of international order. And we must defend these laws at any cost because the consequences for the victims and humanity are too grave to accept. From the very beginning of the Russian attack, various efforts have been made to document the core international crimes. Almost immediately, Ukraine itself took many measures to step up the judicial response. It not only sued Russia before the International Court of Justice, but also set up a web page where Ukrainian citizens could report war crimes by Russian forces. The Ukrainian authorities have already opened almost 10,000 investigations into war crimes. The volume, but also the complexity of the investigations, require both considerable human and technical resources and specialized expertise. I keep in regular direct contact with the Minister of Justice and the Prosecutor General of Ukraine. Following up on the specific needs of the Ukrainian authorities is important to ensure they can carry out their criminal investigations. 
But not only the Ukrainian prosecution services have been very active. The prosecution services in 11 member states have already opened investigations into the core international crimes committed in Ukraine. A joint investigation team between Lithuania and Poland was also set up with the support of Eurojust. Ukraine takes part in the team as a third state based on an international mutual assistance agreement. Eurojust has intensified its cooperation with the International Criminal Court, which is also taking part now in the joint investigation team, a first in the court's history. This shows how crucial it is for all competent authorities to cooperate at European and international level. Only together we will be able to provide justice and fight impunity. But not only the public authorities have been documenting evidence. Also citizens, journalists, civil society organizations and victims are taking videos and pictures with their mobile phones. To bring the perpetrators to justice, it is essential that the collect information is admissible as evidence in court. To this end, Eurojust can play a crucial role by providing guidelines. Providing a central storage facility for the evidence is also crucial, as well as a backup storage for Ukrainian prosecutors to preserve it in a safe environment. On the 25th of April, the Commission adopted a legislative proposal to amend the, the Eurojust regulation. The proposal aims at establishing a legal basis for Eurojust to receive, assess and store evidence relating to genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. With its new task, Eurojust should receive pre-selected information which may be used as evidence before courts. Close cooperation with national competent authorities, with other EU agencies, especially Europol, but also civil society organizations, will be key for a successful implementation. The existing close cooperation with the Genocide Network, the Ukrainian Liaison Prosecutor Post in two years just, as well as the now close relationship with the ICC will be very helpful. To this end, we also strengthened Eurojust's mandate regarding cooperation with international judicial authorities, especially the ICC. Eurojust will support member states with targeted analysis and assessment of evidence. For example, Eurojust can contribute to establishing the constituent elements of war crimes, which are highly complex and technical offenses as well as a chain of command. The proposal also aims at upgrading the agency's technical infrastructure. And finally, it allows Eurojust to process additional categories of data which have proven especially important, such as videos and audio recordings or satellite images. I hope we could have an entry into force already in June. I wish you very interesting debates and I look forward to hearing more about the achievements and the challenges and remaining gaps in the prosecution of core international crimes. Thank you. After keynote remarks of uh, Mr. Reynolds, EU Commissioner for Justice, I would invite um, Excellency Louise Vassy, French Ambassador to the Netherlands, to devote us um, keynote remarks on behalf of the French Presidency. Uh, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Tout d'abord, je voudrais euh, saluer le président de Rojust, M. Amran, ainsi que vous-même, Mathéus, pour euh, tout le travail remarquable que vous mettez en œuvre. Je voudrais aussi saluer les ambassadeurs présents, les palénistes et l'ensemble des participants à ce séminaire. Maybe you will allow me a few words in French before I switch to, to English. 
Tout d'abord, donc, je tiens à remercier le réseau Génocide, euh, évidemment la Commission européenne et Eurojust d'avoir organisé ce webinaire, webinaire à l'occasion de la septième journée européenne de lutte contre l'impunité. En tant que représentant euh, de la France, qui aujourd'hui préside le Conseil de l'Union européenne, je suis évidemment extrêmement honoré de pouvoir participer à cet événement et à pouvoir m'exprimer après le commissaire Reinders. Un événement qui vise à sensibiliser le public aux efforts conduits, notamment dans l'Union européenne, pour lutter contre l'impunité des grands crimes internationaux, crimes de génocide, crimes contre l'humanité et crimes de guerre. Cette initiative vise notamment à mettre en avant les enquêtes et poursuites conduites par les acteurs judiciaires nationaux et à reconnaître le travail commun fourni par l'Union européenne ainsi que les États. Il arrive à un moment clé, nous le savons tous, alors que nous vivons des évolutions fondamentales affectant le système de la justice pénale internationale. So today we are gathered for this event entitled On the front line of justice, preparedness of the EU and member states in fighting impunity for core international crimes. To take stock and to outline the perspectives of the global strategy to fight impunity for international crimes. France uh, welcomes, of course, the report of the Genocide Network that was just mentioned uh, and released today, which highlights the efforts made by member states to better, better equip national jurisdictions while identifying the remaining difficulties revealed by practice and which call for further reflections. For today, since you give me the opportunity of a few uh, words before your uh, panel kicks off, uh, I would like to to do things in a, in a pretty French way, if you allow me. So um, I have mainly uh, three points that I would like to share. But before I enter into that, I would like to address the obvious, which is uh, the why of us uh, developing at the European level such work when it comes to, uh, and such effort when it comes to uh, fighting impunity against uh, major crimes. We do it, of course, because our own project, the EU, is very much rooted into the uh, idea of uh, rule of law and the fact that it's a fundamental basis for the functioning of our society, societies. And what is true, of course, at uh, the national level is necessarily true at the European level to make the project uh, uh, sustainable. And uh, we also wish that this is true at the end. In mind, uh, the, the victims, obviously, of uh, these major, major interns left unpunished. I would like to say that um, it's been a, a core element of work, um, including what uh, issues pertaining to um, uh, international criminal justice. We have likewise Nadia Murad, herself a victim of one of the most atrocious uh, episodes of uh, recent history, mainly crimes, the uh, involvement of his own country when it comes to fighting impunity. Um, but today I would like really, and I will be brief, I promise to share a few uh, remarks after three years uh, holding this post in the in the Hague on, on the how and how to make uh, our system not only rooted in principles, but also impactful, which is obviously what we all want to, to do in the end. So um, to do that, I think uh, our system needs to be first agile, it needs to be clear, and it, need, it needs to be uh, focused. And I think it's a necessity to be an innovative uh, or to, to make the system innovative. Innovative uh, when it comes to procedures, uh, even though we all have our, have our, const, our text and our attached to them, um, I have to say that I am extremely pleased to see that Eurojust and the ICC have been able to innovate when it comes to procedures to make sure that the ICC would be, participate in the JIT that was already mentioned. I am personally and for France uh, extremely proud that the first meeting between President Am Yes, I'm here. Uh, that the first meeting between President Amran and the uh, prosecutor can happened uh, at the at the French residence actually a few months ago, when we uh, were all pushing to make sure that uh, when it came to uh, the referral uh, by uh, state parties to the ICC uh, of the Ukraine crisis, the Eurojust would Eurojust would be uh, fully taken into account uh, for its uh, vast experience when it comes to international co cooperation to fight against major crimes. 
we need of course to be innovative uh, when it comes to operations and there i think um, i'm proud to say that my country and many other european countries have been already pledging funds for the icc to make sure that it's able uh, to catch up with some of the uh, last technological developments when it comes to the use of uh, ai for example uh, in the um, uh, management of uh, evidence, uh, developing database, databases or uh, gathering evidence. Um, and of course, Eurojust also uh, will be developing. It's relative also means uh, going faster. We know that time is of the essence when, we, when it comes to evidence gathering uh, for major crime. And there too, we've been able to be very flexible in our procedures. I'm again extremely proud that France was able to send a, a forensics team uh, in Ukraine um, already a couple of uh, weeks ago. That team is already there. Um, and there too, we have shown flexibility because we sent our team to cooperate with the Ukrainian investigation while saying that we would share uh, the evidence that was gathered with uh, the ICC at the same time. On the other hand, the Dutch authorities have uh, deployed their own team uh, uh, by seconding, seconding it uh, to the ICC. And I think it shows that um, whatever administrative arrangements we decide to set in place, we are always able to, um, let's say, uh, say uh, understand that what is really at stake uh, is um, uh, the ability to go fast and the necessity to be flexible when it comes to uh, the exact procedures we will follow. What is extremely reassuring is that we've been able to uphold what I would say the, the spirit of The Hague, which is a no turf wars. Uh, it's, uh, it's a commitment that the prosecutor of the ACC and President Amran took when they came to the residence at the very beginning of all this, beginning of March. And I am extremely pleased to see that uh, right now everyone is focused on uh, evidence gathering. And then we'll see um, how things uh, are being um, set in motion when it comes to the um, prosecution itself. So my second point, uh, it's a good transition for that, is the necessity to be clear. Um, necessity to be clear is, I think, um, first and foremost, uh, and I say it as a representative of the executive branch, uh, the necessity to let the judiciary do its work in full independence, which means that, of course, uh, there is no uh, predetermined mind mandate or result of any investigation, and that's true for Ukraine as it is true for any other case. Um, and uh, that spirit of independence must be um, up, uh, uphold uh, in its uh, widest, I would say, um, definition. So it's not only states not interfering, but also non-state actors, whatever their 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 goodwill. I think need to be uh, to refrain from uh, either pressuring or advising the prosecutors on what they should be doing, even though of course they can be uh, very useful actors when it comes to uh, setting in place the uh, investigations. Second point, but I also already touched a little bit upon it, uh, is the notion of uh, complementarity. Um, as the prosecutor of the ICC has said, has said, and as many others uh, and national prosecutors have said also, um, if we take the case of Ukraine, but it's also true in other instances, the magnitude of the crimes that are being committed makes that uh, many courts will be involved in the uh, actual prosecution and sentencing of war criminals. Um, and it means that we will need to make sure uh, that we uh, arrange and organize a clear uh, set of, com uh, 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 of competence based on the principle of complementarity to which we have all um, uh, abided. And there I would like to underline specifically the, the role of national uh, jurisdictions. They have uh, registered major successes in the last few years. We had the um, other day at our genocide event, the prosecutor that uh, pursued in Germany uh, one of the major recent cases against Daesh, French and Swedish courts have, uh, have also been extremely active and also cooperating through uh, the genocide network uh, and Eurojust. And so we have gathered some experience there that I, I hope will be uh, uh, useful uh, in the future. 
Then I would like also to say that clarity means understanding that besides the judiciary, uh, there are all other uh, ways to uh, fight against impunity. Um, at the international level, of course, we all have in mind the triple IM, for example, but I would like also to uh, mention, because I'm also in charge here in The Hague of the um, chemical non-proliferation uh, side, uh, we, I, I would like also to mention the IIT, for example, that we've set in place, um, or the uh, PCIAC, which is the uh, initiative to fight against impunity uh, in the use of chemical weapons. Um, and there, these bodies, of course, are not judicial um, uh, organs, but still can gather evidence in an unbiased and professional manner that may be useful in the future in other contexts. And besides all that, of course, advocacy and the role of the civil society uh, is also extremely important um, and can uh, play a role in the overall architecture uh, of the fight against immunity. And then uh, maybe this will be the more uh, original point I would like to make. Uh, it's the necessity of, of, of remaining focused. That would be my, my third and final point. Um, there, uh, I would really like uh, to use an example rather than make um, a principled petition. Uh, and the example I would like to use is the recent uh, huge manipulation of information uh, that France has almost been the victim of uh, in the case of Mali. So as some of you uh, might have seen, uh, and if you have not, I really advise you to see the, the footage and the, and the, and the videos uh, that the press has had access to. Um, the uh, Wagner Group uh, that we find in other places where uh, massive crimes have been uh, committed uh, basically planted or a mass grave um, just beside a French base in Mali that um, our troops uh, had just left uh, with the intent of claiming that a major crime had been committed by us. Um, unfortunately for the per perpetrators of such manipulation, uh, we caught them on camera and so the whole thing uh, blew up pretty quickly. Um, still, I would like to say that we live in a world of manipulation of information and we were lucky in that case to be able, able to film it and make it then um, impossible to claim that uh, we were responsible. Um, but imagine if we had not caught uh, the Russians on camera. Um, many would have come to ask us questions, which is of course legitimate, um, and and then the mediatic arm, let's say, or the the uh, would have been huge. So there is a necessity, I think, to be extremely rigorous when we look at the quality of sources before jumping uh, in the media cycle, let's say, uh, which is always uh, tempting when it comes to major crimes. Um, let's take a breath, look at the quality of the sources, the quality of the evidence, uh, and make sure that uh, we, held, uh, we hold accountable uh, the real bad guys um, and not um, uh, the ones that are that have been that are being victims of manipulations um, manipulations of information uh, are a new reality and they will also apply to the unfortunately uh, to the um, international criminal uh, justice system um, of course it's sad to see that we have actors that have uh, absolutely no moral limits that will be able to plant false false mass graves uh, that will be able then by doing that to to or, or, or willing, let's say, to uh, weaken the whole system or, archi of archi or architecture of uh, international criminal justice. But that's a reality we still need to be facing. Um, and, and that point needs to be specifically addressed because it will be a key point uh, for the judiciary, of course. But usually they work on the long term and make sure that the quality of the, of the evidence that they have uh, um, uh, meets uh, uh, some standards. But uh, that needs also to be true uh, for all actors states, of course, and civil society also. Thank you very much for having me and giving me the opportunity to share these few thoughts uh, as an introduction to your discussions, um, and I give you back the floor. Many thanks, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for these really inspiring thoughts uh, in your keynote remarks. On many points uh, you have, uh, I'm sure that many points you have raised will resonate during the panel discussion and will uh, reflect upon that. And with that, uh, we have uh, closed the, the introductory part with a welcoming and keynote remarks.
and now I will um, present the uh, four panelists uh, that will uh, continue this discussion of today. We have uh, uh, four excellent uh, uh, um, experts, um, colleagues as well, and friends um, in this panel discussion that will address uh, the main topic of today, how prepared the EU and member states are in fighting impunity for core international crimes, and of course, what has been done in the past years uh, to reach the level where we are, and more, moreover, where else, what other aspects, measures we need to look at to see, um, to explore, to improve um, our capacity in dealing with, um, with um, accountability. So um, the four speakers that will uh, that have joined us today for the panel are Mr. Gerard Dief, President of Belgian Task Force for International Criminal Justice, uh, Ms. Rina Devgun, Senior Public Prosecutor and Coordinator for the Swedish War Crime Prosecutors, Mr. Vincent Silesen, Team Leader, International Crimes Unit at the Police in the Netherlands, and Mr. Ru Rupert Skilbeck, Director of Redress. Um, as you can see, each of the panelists comes from a different um, expertise of uh, accountability, from judicial cooperation, from prosecution services, from police and from civil society. In that way, we will hear aspects of all perspectives and all relevant points in relation to addressing accountability. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and as referred by Ambassador, we have published two publications um, on this um, for this day, uh, looking at the successes, but also the key factors for successful investigations and the trends. And I would, of course, uh, invite all um, to look into those publications later on, and we can also publish the links um, on our uh, chat. But um, I would suggest that we start with the, with the panelists, and the, the first one would be Mr. Gerard Dief, presenting the perspective from more judicial cooperation point of view. Dear Gerard, it's my delight to have you today in the panel. I think you were in the first panel in 2016 during the first EU Day Against Impunity, so I'm really uh, um, pleased to see you again today on the 7th, um, and I would really enjoy hearing from you on the developments we have achieved in the past years. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Mr. Moderator Di Mateusz, Mr. Amran, President of Eurojust, Mr. Reinders, EU Commissioner for Justice, Votre Excellence, Monsieur Vassy, uh, l'Ambassadeur de France auprès des Pays-Bas, Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, I warmly thank the organizers for inviting me to intervene at this important occasion. Today, we reach a new step in the Genocide Network accomplishment. As it has been said this year, the EU Day Against Impunity aims to focus on a practical assessment of the strategy of the EU Genocide Network, formally endorsed by the Council Conclusions in 2015. But first, let me address my thoughts to the victims of the heinous crimes we combat, especially in these troubled times. Mr. Moderator, you are well placed to know that, like you, I was one of the co-drafters of the strategy, which drafting and adoption have represented a milestone in the development of the network, in particular, and in the light in the fight, sorry, against impunity within the EU member states and their partners in general. We were ambitious, but still, how many achievements obtained, and still, how many to reach and reinforce. Being an officer in charge with mutual legal assistance, let's focus in this short introduction on two challenges raised by the strategy in its first draft. The first measure recommended by the strategy was, I quote, establishing, advancing and promoting specialized units, end of quote. And a sub-measure was, I still quote, establishment of national task force on impunity 
to ensure cooperation and collaboration of specialized units, end of quote. Let's speak first of the specialized units. While we have seen such units developed during these last years at the prosecution and investigating level in many states, it is more modest at the mutual level assistance level, the MLA level. This could be a new challenge for the near future. In Belgium, the unit I lead is in charge with the bilateral interstate judicial cooperation and MLA for international branch of concern today. But in order to specialize and concentrate the knowledge and know-how in this matter, we are also the central authority for cooperation with all the international criminal tribunals and mechanism or international groups of experts, namely those established by the United Nations Human Rights Council, in charge with the fight against impunity of these core international crimes. We have direct contact and access with most of them without using the diplomatic channel in order to speed action and reaction and to go back to our national prosecution or investigation authorities. This permits us to better understand the requests and needs through direct contacts and more expeditious way of implementation and execution of the requests. This leads us to the creation of a national network. Due to the pivotal role played at the national and international level by my unit, we have also established the Belgium Task Force for the International Criminal Justice, which I preside. It gathers 24, I have said 24 different national authorities. Justice, Foreign Affairs, Defense, Home Affairs, Diplomatic Authorities, Intelligence Service, Migration Authorities, Specialized Prosecution Units, Specialized Police Units, for instance, the one fighting impunity for core international crimes, and the one in charge with the protection of threatened witnesses, etc. It's a network of specialized units or points of contact at the national level which can be very quickly activated, for instance, on a specific format for a specific request for assistance. We centralize the pertinent information. We have designated specific persons as points of contact through all these authorities. Like the EU Genocide Network did at the European level, it has boosted tremendously our action at the national level. Establishing these kinds of national task force would be a new challenge in the future for other EU members. The second challenge I want to uh, talk about uh, today, Mr. Moderator, um, is relating to the third measure of the strategy, which was, I quote, putting in place a system of effective cooperation. And more specifically, the eighth sub-measure I quote, the need for a global framework of cooperation among states, end of quote. It is referred to the project of a new international treaty known as the MLA Initiative, and I quote once again the text of the strategy, a global framework of cooperation among states is required to resolve the challenges arising from the lack of a mechanism for judicial cooperation among states, end of quote. I must specify it's especially the case at the international level, not at the European one. This extremely ambitious challenge is today close to reach its accomplishment. Under the steering role of the so-called core group composed of Argentina, Belgium, Mongolia, the Netherlands, Senegal and Slovenia, supported today by 70 other states through over the world, a drafted treaty has been established, will be examined in the last round of virtual consultation next June, and will be negotiated if the sanitary situation continues to permit it in Slovenia mid-2023, so next year. 
the experience and challenges faced within the Genocide Network have tremendously inspired the initiator of the project. And let me assure you that within their own country, by discussing with the future negotiator of the new treaty, the EU Genocide Network members could have a key role in ensuring that the new text reaches all its assigned goals and challenges for the practitioner's point of view. Mr. Moderator, I could continue like this for hours, but it's not the point. These matters have been at the center of my professional career for such a long time now. But I think we will develop other topics during the Q&A session. I thank you all for your attention. Dear Gerard, many thanks for your intervention, for your thoughts um, on the 7th EU Day Against Impunity, and particularly highlighting two main points, creation of national task force. Um, I'm, I'm, I was impressed to hear that uh, you coordinate 24 different authorities within the Belgian task force, and um, that's surely a model that uh, we, can, uh, we can foresee also for other countries, even if there would be lesser amount of national authorities in this uh, respect. But nonetheless, I think it's very important to bring all the re relevant national stakeholders in one room um, um, to discuss uh, how to best address accountability. I think it's a model you can clearly see uh, to have relevance in other jurisdictions as well. And as you mentioned, without the cooperation, without the framework to cooperate between countries, it will be hard to, to um, discuss accountability. So the initiative for the mutual legal assistance and extradition uh, legal framework is surely something that deserves um, a close attention and work in the coming months. Many thanks again for your uh, presentation. Um, and um, we will uh, later on uh, uh, address most likely um, furthermore with questions and answers. That will bring me to our next uh, panelist, um, Ms. Rena Devgun, Senior Public Prosecutor, a dear friend, um, also coordinator of, of the Swedish War Crimes uh, team. And uh, I would uh, invite you to take the floor and join us uh, in this panel. Thank you so very much, Matevs, and thank you to the French Presidency of the Council, the European Commission, Eurojust and the Genocide Network for inviting me. Uh, to this important day and in highlighting these matters of great consequence to all of us. And as to the question that I've been asked to address, if the EU, its member states and partners are up to the task of achieving justice for atrocities perpetrated in Syria, Ukraine and elsewhere, and if national authorities are prepared to tackle an ever-increasing complex caseload? Well, I would say that my answer is yes and no. In 2017, Human Rights Watch applauded Sweden and Germany in a report, The Long Arm of Justice, for being the first two countries to hold trials and convict people for atrocities committed in Syria. We were, quote, putting war criminals on notice that they would have to pay for their crimes, end quote. So why is that? Why Sweden and Germany? Well, I think there are many reasons, and I will focus on the most central one. It is the existence of independent specialized units within the police and prosecution services. And as to the question of being prepared, well, I would say that the first building block is to create units or at least appoint prosecutors and investigators. Because if no one can investigate and bring these cases to a courtroom, there is no possibility to address these atrocities. <clears throat> and, in pian sorry, and in ending impunity for core international crimes means universal accountability. I would commend the already existing units, but this is not sufficient. In order to be prepared, there needs to be some sort of structure within each jurisdiction that can deal with investigating these crimes. Otherwise, we can risk safe havens. I am full of admiration when I follow my fellow prosecutors' colleagues in Ukraine that they, under the most dire of circumstances, are able to investigate and facilitate war crimes trials. For me, this confirms that existence of institutional independence, endurance and will can take us a very long way. 
Our unit in Sweden began back in 2008, consisting of only one to two prosecutors and a few investigators within the police. Today, we have almost 15 investigators within the police, analyst staffs, and also intelligence officers, and in combination with 12 especially appointed prosecutors. When I began working within the EU community of dealing with core international crimes, that is within the genocide network, seven years ago, I was under the impression that it was important, that it is the right person, someone extremely dedicated, that needs to exist to have a functioning specialized, un specialized unit or a person that could actually make something happen. This is true. And I will say that some of my former colleagues are the key factor to our success. And I know that many of my current EU colleagues can mention the exact individuals that were the front runners for establishing units within their respective countries. And some are even in this panel today. But what I have learned is these past years that there is a next step. And that is that when, even though these pioneers leave for other missions or retire, the regrowth of these dedicated staff is guaranteed. That is, when the work of these pioneers would result in the institutional guarantee of the unit's existence. That is, when there is an institutional memory to uphold the legacy once created. I would say that this is the case today in several EU countries. I think when I quit or my panel colleague from the Netherlands would leave his unit, our units will still stand and still investigate core international crimes for a long time ahead. I think we, both Sweden and the Netherlands, are example of units that have come so far. But if we want to fight impunity for these atrocities, we need to create some sort of institutional guarantee for it in every corner of Europe, and also to strive to take it further than so. We need to organize ourselves to strengthen the capacity as a whole within the EU and with each member state. And this does not necessarily mean that each member state should establish a big unit consisting of several investigation, investigators or prosecutors. I think this is an unrealistic demand. But there needs, however, to be at least one nomination point of contact. And for those who do not have a unit, that one pioneer. This time, though, someone who does that does not need to reinvent the veal, which I think some of my predecessors did. Within the genocide network, there are decades of experience collected in several different jurisdictions that can be shared. And for those that have that one pioneer, but not a permanent unit, there's a need also for political will to ensure the continued existence and growth of the national capacity to investigate core international crimes. Basically, to allow these pioneers to build a structure that will outlast the individuals in it. I think this is important, not only on a domestic level, to ensure the capacity within the country, but also we know from experience that these investigations require the close cooperation ex exchange between units, exactly the seamless exchange that we have under the lead of our Secretariat and Matevs within the Genocide Network. And I think that these are key factors for creating the long-term capacity, perseverance and will to answer the task that we have ahead of us and our common strive to end impunity for these horrendous crimes. And I look forward to continue this discussion in the panel. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Rina, for a perspective um, from a prosecutor and the need to have uh, specialized units. Um, I particularly like your, your, your sentence saying, if you don't have a unit, uh, who will then investigate and, and prosecute? So who will then address accountability if you have no one to do the job, uh, to put it that way? Um, I think it's also important the growth you have mentioned from one to two prosecutors back in 2008, which is basically 14 years ago, to 12 prosecutors today, of course, with all uh, colleagues in law enforcement and, and, and so on. Uh, so that really shows uh, also the trend we have uh, observed on, on EU level in the increase of the number of cases 
um, in, in, in overall um, uh, numbers. Uh, but of course, that also then particularly applies to Sweden as well um, in that respect. Um, and uh, what is, I think, also an important takeaway, um, it's uh, the need for continuous resources to ensure uh, that uh, these uh, units um, are functioning um, as they need and be prepared to address accountability. Um, I think these are all very important points you have raised, um, and I'm sure we will come back to them uh, during the Q&A session um, in, the, in the later in the day. Um, next speaker is coming from uh, law enforcement. Um, it's uh, Mr. Vincent Zilson, team leader at the International Crimes Unit, um, in the Netherlands, um, Vincent, a dear friend, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hear your thoughts um, on this day and in relation to the topic on addressing accountability and the preparedness of the EU. I'm uh, confident you have uh, very good thoughts and good tips from the Dutch perspective. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for giving me the stream. Uh, it's truly an honor to speak at such an important day and event. Uh, let me start with thanking the organizers for making this possible again. Um, I've been asked to raise a few points from the police perspective of fighting the impunity of international crimes. Uh, I can do this reasonably well from a Dutch national perspective, but to a lesser extent from a European police perspective, because many uh, of the many differences between the countries. Um, let me start with saying that my unit went through some changes the last few years. Necessary changes because of the constant changing nature and demands of our work. On the one hand, the size of my team and the amount of cases has been growing significantly. Uh, the war in Syria, for example, has generated an additional duty to our already existing caseload. Apart from the numbers, also the investigational methods have diversified. Every single case that generated from crimes in the last decade has pieces of photo and video material at its core of evidence coll collection, as an example. This demands for other additional skills. Open source intelligence, social media intelligence and geolocating have become essential for successful case building. In addition to this, no long longer can the subject of fighting international crimes be seen as independent and disconnected from other crime areas. The cooperation, for example, with counterterrorism has become a key element of our work as well. This means that we and our counterparts that are fighting connected crime areas need to understand and recognize each other's work to be able to successfully cooperate and support each other. This has been part of the reason why we adjusted our information and working process, where in the past we started our work with a suspect and build a case from there. Nowadays, we start with a significant amount of scattered information, which is being collected by a large number of national, international, public, and private organizations. And in order to decide which case to actually investigate, the collection and analysis phase of a working process has become crucial and a matter of well thought international cooperation between both public and private organizations and every mechanism that comes in between. One other matter that I do not want to leave unnamed is that we, during the last decade, for the first time in history, started to investigate and prosecute to an unprecedented scale during an armed conflict. The demands and circumstances for these investigations are quite different. Crime scenes cannot be visit, visited physically. The security of witnesses and victims need thorough attention and there's a constant information flow that needs to be captured because one day it could become evidence. One of the additional challenges that we faced in the Netherlands is that we were criticized by the public of, so far, only prosecuting Syrian opposition and terrorism cases. Time will tell us how this will work out. Having said that, we do not only face the dilemma of keeping balance within a country file, we also have the obligation to keep the right balance between the more recent and less recent international crimes cases. We should not forget it is, for, it's for, it is for a reason that these crimes are not statute barred. From a victim's perspective, justice is never delivered too soon, but in the end, better late than never. This brings me to my last point. 
Again, we face a large armed conflict with an enormous refugee flow and let there be no mistake, again, horrific crimes have and are being committed as we speak. And again, we will be challenged to strengthen and develop our existing values and mechanisms at both the national and international level, for these will be tested. Staying un impartial and unbiased as an investigator in a heavily divided world can be hard, but it is key for successful survival and development. In the end, it is not trial by media, let alone victor's justice, that will bring us the kind of justice and accountability we are striving for as an international crimes community. Many thanks for your time. I'm giving the screen back to you, Matthäus. Many thanks, uh, Vincent, um, for this um, um, highly informative introduction um, on the work you do from police level, from investigation level, and particularly, I think uh, you, you mentioned the need for new skills that uh, these days we conduct uh, investigations differently than before. So you need an open source um, expert, you need geolocation expert, um, and uh, basically not only starting from, from a suspect, so kind of walking jurisdiction when, when a person, a, suspe a suspect comes to your territory and that triggers the jurisdiction, but already before you need to have an understanding of a conflict of a situation um, and sort of uh, navigate through the enormous amount of information available uh, in public domain. Um, and of course, that uh, um, among the changes that also uh, these days, uh, you do the remote investigations more or less from, from your office uh, so that the, the role or, um, of the function of the investigator has changed, no, no longer having access to the territory because there is an ongoing armed conflict and uh, you need to do the, the, the work uh, um, um, remotely in that, in that respect. So I think very, very important points um, on uh, looking also at the preparedness of national uh, administration, national jurisdiction, and consequently EU to deal uh, with this, with this uh, type of criminality. So really appreciate your thoughts um, in this respect. Um, and uh, the next uh, panelist will be a representative from uh, civil society, Mr. Rupert Skilbeck, he's director of Redress, and will share perspective, of thoughts um, on behalf of the civil society actors, um, who are also, as we know, some of them present into the uh, in, in the genocide network. But um, I'm really looking forward to hear Rupert's uh, perspective from um, from Redress, but of course also from civil society. Uh, who's uh, usually um, leading us uh, to an uncharted territory, but sometimes also criticizing us on what we can do better. So uh, the floor is yours, Rupert. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, having civil society perspective included in this very important event. Civil society, as well as uh, police, investigators and prosecutors, represent survivors of international crimes and we often hear what it is that they want and for many survivors justice is incredibly important and the second thing that they often mention is that this should never happen to anyone else but we have to be honest it will happen again and there is also a vast accountability gap which means that most perpetrators will not face prosecution but what our job is is to make that more difficult and to constantly increase the likelihood of accountability that, so that we can honestly say that going forward there will be more likelihood of perpetrators being brought to justice and we must make it more difficult for this to happen again. But civil society has a critical role in this long view of what it is we're trying to do and the report published today has some very important issues. From the perspective of civil society there is clearly still a significant legal gap in Europe with regard to the application of universal jurisdiction. And the war in Ukraine has made that very apparent as certain jurisdictions simply don't have the laws in place that will allow them to take these cases forward appropriately. Uh, and a, a series of additional national level reports published today by Trial International in, in conjunction with various NGOs, including my own, uh, has gone through three other countries, bringing to a total of, I think, 12 countries whose laws have been analyzed identifying the gaps that there exist. Another gap that civil society has highlighted is the lack of perhaps concerted advocacy on universal jurisdiction 
at an EU level. There are quite often short-term projects, which mean that civil society can constantly brief lawmakers and other people with positions of influence within the European Union. There isn't currently a long-term project that makes that happen, and so that's a current gap. There's also a need for structured coordination between different civil society groups working on universal jurisdiction. And again, the situation in Ukraine has highlighted quite how many individual actors are involved in the importance of that coordination. And what we also notice is that curiously, it is still difficult to get up to date information on universal jurisdiction cases. Not surprisingly, as quite often the early stages of the process are confidential and necessarily so. But are there ways that we can enhance that? So the role of civil society in this process of, of enhancing accountability is an important one. Uh, as has been mentioned, various NGOs, I think six or seven of us, are formal observers to the EU Genocide Network, and those NGOs coordinate with other NGOs across Europe for those meetings in order to represent a broader range of views from civil society. Specifically, there have been uh, NGO projects for about 20 years focusing on international crimes at the European Union level. Most recently, uh, about nine or 10 years worth of work looking at the rights of victims in international criminal proceedings, which has had a, a real impact on the operation of the EU Genocide Network and the development of the strategy within it. One question that does come up is the role of civil society in documentation. And I think that was recognized by Mr. Hamran earlier on in his introduction as an important element of what happens. It is important that there are high levels of professionalism uh, and that we do act as a worthy counterpart for investigators and prosecutors. But that has taken place clearly in Syria, where there was a significant civil society role to play in documentation of what has happened there, both with Syrian NGOs, international NGOs and others, um, engaging with the IIIM and other national prosecution bodies as well. It's a, a new area with regard to Belarus, where the international accountability platform for Belarus is doing documentation in the absence of an effective national mechanism that can deal with that. And it's quite clear that in Ukraine, there is a role for civil society, particularly in the early stages, where it's very difficult for the formal in investigators to get on the ground and do the uh, investigations that need to be done urgently. So that role is clearly part of what civil society does, but a role that needs to be constantly reviewed and made even more professional. What uh, perhaps is needed going forward for civil society to focus on? Well, it, it seems to some of the NGOs who are involved in this area of work that there are three areas where more could be done. Uh, a prime role, and perhaps the, the most significant role for civil society is developing individual cases, either acting as victims representatives in those countries that allow such a process or essentially supporting the early investigation of international crimes and making connections with the specialist war crimes units to enable them to build cases uh, with the specific expertise that civil society groups can bring. Uh, that work needs to go forward with perhaps more practitioner workshops, more coordination meetings, promoting more effectively a survivor-centered approach, and also working very closely between the national NGOs, who may be both best placed to assist, particularly, for example, in Ukraine, the international NGOs with specific expertise in universal jurisdiction, but then also making connections with civil society further afield, where they might be involved in universal jurisdiction cases. The second area that I think civil society work could develop further is on legal policy advocacy. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning, there are clearly quite a few gaps still in the legal framework, particularly in the practice of it and its application, that need to be reviewed carefully and drawn to the attention of policymakers and other stakeholders. That will require a, a small amount of legal research. We pretty well know where the flaws already are. Some expert meetings to, br to bring together the people who can recommend how most simply to fill those gaps. And then also concerted policy advocacy at European and national level. The third area, I think it would help address the fact that there is still not enough information out there about universal jurisdiction cases. And so can civil society work to enhance information sharing and outreach through their publications, through watching what's going on in individual cases, and through social media that is the easiest way to bring attention to the important work that's being done by everyone. So in conclusion, there is now a real wave of interest across Europe 
with regard to the way that universal jurisdiction actually works in practice, given the current situation in Ukraine. This gives us a perhaps the, the most concrete opportunity for real policy change that has happened for several years, where uh, there is political will to make the changes that are necessarily necessary to really enhance accountability within Europe. We hope that civil society has a key role within that process, and we look forward to working with other elements of, uh, that we have heard from today in making that more of a reality. Many thanks, uh, Rupert, for your thoughts from the perspective of civil society. I'm aware that also several NGOs have uh, published a joint press release uh, today, which we can uh, share in a chat to all participants as well. Later on, um, highlighting the aspects uh, um, in relation to accountability in, in the EU. Uh, but I think, uh, Rupert, from your uh, intervention, um, I think what's, uh, what is in extremely important is, of course, that uh, before you can, in a way, start investigating, you need to have legislation uh, in place and uh, how to find information on appropriate legislation. I think uh, that's always a, um, a line that we try to um, advocate, to stress. It's hard for any practitioner to raise a case if he doesn't have uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity in its penal code. Um, I particularly uh, listened very carefully your points on the role of the civil society in documenting uh, these crimes. You referred to Syria um, situation, but of course many of those aspects could be relevant also in relation to Ukraine and the relationship between public and private uh, partnership. And all three areas you have highlighted for improvement are absolutely significant to take into account uh, for future work. So with all the panelists um, um, sharing their, their thoughts, of course, it comes to, to you, dear participants, to join uh, the discussion, um, to pose uh, questions. Um, for this purpose, please use uh, the chat box. Um, please um, mention, um, either put a question there and we will read it out, or if you request um, the floor um, via the chat, and then we will uh, um, offer um, unmute um, and offer you possibility to pose a question. So you're kindly invited to share your thoughts on the panelists' uh, interventions, thoughts that have been raised, uh, but also on broader um, um, kind of opinions um, but, uh, and, and questions as well. Um, while we, we do that, I would basically have a question that I would like to address to all four panelists. And that would be, for example, Gerard, you are... Um, had your president of, of the Belgian task force. Um, Rina, you have a specialized uh, unit in Sweden. And, and, and Vincent, for you, um, I think you had um, a, a big growth in the past years in, in the resources. I think in 2008, uh, 2014, you had around 20, 25 pro investigators in your team. Now you have 42. Um, my question would be, what is that sparkle uh, from, from your perspective, from national perspective, that triggered uh, this engagement of your countries um, into, um, in, in setting up um, either a national task force or creating a national specialized units on, on prosecution investigative level? Because when we were drafting this report, we saw that those countries that had specialized units back in 2014, they have them as well now and are uh, more successful. They have uh, um, more resources, more staff there, and consequently more cases. And then the question is how we can find this sparkle in other um, EU countries, uh, in other member states, um, how we could uh, trigger this process um, of setting up um, specialized units and dedicating staff also in other countries. So what would be your advice, um, your suggestion in this respect. And maybe if we follow um, in the order of panelists, uh, we'd first invite Gerard, then Rina, and then uh, Vincent. And of course, at the end, also Rupert to offer his perspective from, from civil society as well. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for the question. I think for Belgium, what uh, triggered the mechanism of creating a specialized unit was the uh, workload due to uh, the um, 
between that and Rwanda when we had the Rwanda tragedy uh, ongoing. Um, and um, potentially, uh, it's awful to say, but the Ukrainian situation uh, is spreading out all the problems uh, in Europe with the uh, victims uh, fleeing uh, Ukraine all over uh, Europe could be a, a trigger mechanism um, in other EU countries. Uh, the necessity to do something uh, based on uh, human feelings. Uh, I, I think um, in Sweden it, it was uh, the, those pioneers that I w would mention in my uh, first address that we had um, um, a recognition of the existence within our own national jurisdiction of individuals that could be war criminals and that there was a need to address this. Uh, but I would like to just say something on the development because I think the fact that we had a small unit uh, with some sort of independence and liberty to act, uh, or we had the legal framework, we had the universal jurisdiction, it made us develop from a unit that would wait, basically, for an extradition request or a case coming in to a unit that I today see as a unit who sort of would gather evidence and also welcome civil society reports, uh, but also to sort of identify, work more actively to actually identify uh, perpetrators within our own jurisdiction and our reach. Uh, and I think that was only possible because we had that small unit with that kind of independ independence that would allow us to increase uh, to, to show and tell how, why we needed more stuff, why we needed analysts, why we needed to develop t to address these is issues. So we needed that first core unit uh, to grow, basically. Thank you, Irina, for, uh, for your thoughts and uh, Vincent, from your perspective. Yes, well, I completely agree with Gerard and Rina. Um, once you have a unit, you can start feeding it yourself and then you can get some public attention and give some examples with where does it really start. Um, for the Netherlands, it started with former Yugoslavia. We, we came into existence as a support unit for the, uh, for the, for the Yugoslav tribunal. Uh, later on, we became a support unit for any tribunal, uh, mainly focused on fugitives. And then after that, uh, we became a full operational unit, first small, then bigger, and well, uh, we've been growing. Um, and once you get even a small unit and um, individuals get caught by this subject of fighting international crimes, it aut almost automatically makes it stronger and bigger. Uh, because once you're in this working field, it's really hard to let go. Uh, and you only want to make it bigger and better. Um, but the first spark, I think uh, Girard is uh, correct. Um, it, it must be... Uh, in, in essence, um, uh, a, a human feeling to, to, to want to start such a thing. And, um, uh, well, unfortunately, we again face an armed conflict in Europe. Um, but then again, it might create momentum, if not already there, to better connect and let things grow, and start things to grow. Um, uh, if this does not make the difference, whatever, what could make the difference? Um, we need to be there. Uh, and even without having your full universal jurisdiction, at least from a police perspective, you could take statements from survivors. And once you start collecting information, you can make the information or evidence available to other countries. Uh, we have Europol in place, uh, the mandate of your justice being augmented. Um, so you can, re you can start really small. Uh, that's, not an, that's not an issue. As Rina says, you don't have to start with 10, 20 or 30 uh, police officers and a dozen uh, prosecutors. Um, one prosecutor, four police officers, and you can start a case. Um, that's that's, where, it, that's where, it, where it should begin. And there's a network uh, we are all willing with existing units 
to advise. We have blueprints uh, for organizing units. Uh, we can advise on what specializations, skills you would like to have there. We can even share expertise and certain skills. Um, uh, the the, the uh, willingness to cooperate uh, and support is there. So uh, I, I, would, I always invite every police organization that considers to start such a unit to, to come over or to, give, to, to make a call. Um, and I can explain where to start at least. Many thanks, uh, Vincent. I think uh, we have uh, trouble with, uh, with Rupert that uh, his connection is, uh, as soon as he joins us, um, um, I'll give him the floor. But um, what I, uh, Vincent, what I would say is, uh, I think this is the number that uh, was missing for our publication on, on key factors for successful investigation. Um, one prosecutor for police officers, that's, uh, I think, the start of the, um, of the, a national war crime unit, and uh, that's something that, uh, of course, um, we will try to advocate in the future. In, in future publications, don't start big, start start small, and of course, uh, in that respect, uh, that can uh, to have the eyes and ears open. Because what in my discussion, what I often heard was, well, we don't need a unit, um, or we don't need specialization because we have no cases, and that's sort of a question of, uh, of um, egg and, and chicken, what, what comes first? Um, and uh, uh, of course, if you don't have someone who would uh, look, investigate these cases, you will not have them. Um, so uh, because they are slightly outside the major focus of, uh, a, 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 as national, uh, for national law enforcement, because for national law enforcement is, look, is looking at, at domestic crimes or these transnational crimes with direct links and so on. And these cases can, can sometimes fall um, outside. My sub uh, question then to, to all three of you would be also, so if you look into what sparkled the setting up of these units in your countries, how we can then ensure the transfer of knowledge. So in a way, uh, your best practices, your expertise, um, to other countries that have just, uh, that might plan to start or have just started or need this kind of expertise due to the immediate influx of, of cases. So we can think in a way also that uh, now with the Ukrainian situation, we have countries that are, have not been usually um, in the front line of fighting impunity, uh, but now they are in this position that they need to um, address and um, uh, this call and, and start investigating, prosecuting. Um, so my question would be, what would be, in your view, the most important um, aspects to transfer this knowledge from, from uh, uh, long uh, established units as, as you have them in your country to those who have uh, only recently set up or those who are thinking of setting up? So how to transfer this information, knowledge, best practice? And maybe we go in the same order as before. So Gerard and then Rina and Vincent. I'm not sure it's fair to, to uh, follow the same order, but uh, I will assume it. Um, I will try to have an original answer. Um, I think, as Rina said, the first step is to be sure that the, the unit survive its creators. And in order to be sure of that, uh, we decided in Belgium very quickly to base the creation of those units on uh, legal texts. For instance, uh, my unit and the Belgian Task Force for International Criminal Justice are created by royal decree with uh, detailed um, provisions and uh, a written re report uh, which explain the need, the necessity, the purpose of creating a unit. And doing that, you have already documents to share with colleagues to explain to them why you need such kind of units. In addition to that, uh, we are publicating uh, an annual report, not for the two last years, which were very special, special years, as you know, but uh, we have a yearly report to the Parliament for the Belgium Task Force, and that also 
is a way to um, advocate the necessity, the usefulness of, of our action. I thank you. Thank you, Gerard, uh, for your uh, um, um, information on, on, on the on the basically the royal decree and and um, the, which outlined the objectives of this work. I think that's uh, that's pretty important. Um, Rina, um, could I invite you to 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 kind of address the question on the transfer of knowledge? Well, I think you are the answer to that. I mean, it's the genocide network, isn't it? That's that's what the genocide network does. That's why it exists. That's why it's so successful. But I would also like to say, of course, um, it's not a question of copy pasting what each country is doing to another. Um, I think we have different units. If you talk about the most permanent units, uh, Sweden, the Netherlands, France and, and Germany, uh, we have very different legal systems, um, different organization, uh, and that doesn't really matter. Uh, I think it's important that there is some sort of institutional um, uh, capacity that, that makes these units permanent and that we listen to these countries that are just starting their units of what they would want, what they need. But as Vincent was saying, we would be very happy to sort of... Um, have an exchange, uh, share our knowledge, but also for each of these units to understand that that's how we did it. Uh, I think it, the issue of structural investigations that a lot of us are, are conducting right now, for us, it was a basically a trip to Germany in May, seven years ago, when a colleague of, of mine and, and I went to Germany to speak um, to the war crimes unit and ask them how they were dealing with the Syrian refugees and that kind of knowledge sharing, uh, practice sharing, it's essential in this line of work. And, and you have to do it a little bit differently depending on your national legislation. Um, but I think the exchange can look very different, but it doesn't have to be that very complicated. It doesn't have to be that big. It doesn't have to be long term. It can be that kind of individual exchange between uh, practitioners, uh, exactly what the genocide network is there for and, and what we can do also on the side through the network. Many thanks well, uh, on this. I think that's what uh, we're trying uh, here with the Secretariat and the team to, to, to address this, but, uh, but nice to hear that. Um, and uh, Vincent, may I invite you to share your thoughts on the transfer of best practice and knowledge uh, from the, the setup units to, to others who are just starting the work? Yes, well, uh, I'm not going to repeat what Gerard and Rina already said, because once you, you need to have your legislation, your jurisdiction, your is, institutional base in order. Once you have that, um, uh, you, of course, need the genocide network. Uh, that's where all the knowledge and expertise is. Um, what I would like to add from a police perspective is uh, about the same uh, as the genocide network at Europol. Uh, your just is the analysis project for international crimes at Europol. That's where you connect with your police colleagues. And I will, from a police perspective, that can be uh, very welcoming. Um, even not, ha not having a unit, uh, uh, all countries, uh, all EU countries are welcome to join these sessions. And also there you can, well, share your knowledge and expertise. Um, and then to bring it back to my national units, like uh, even if it's already there, you need to train investigators for international crimes. And uh, they're, they're, they're really good institutions where you can get and buy excellent training. I don't know, but at the Netherlands Police Academy, you cannot uh, follow the course of uh, international crimes. So we have to buy that somewhere else. And uh, we have very good experiences uh, on that level. So every one of my team members that joins the unit uh, will be sent out to follow training courses outside the police. Uh, so training would be uh, an addition to uh, uh, the, 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 the excellent network with, with, which we have via, via, via you um, and Europol um, training. Um, and I think uh, from that perspective, of course, when you want to start, it's also hard to get uh, um, uh, the budget. And uh, it, it might, you might consider that from an EU level, um, uh, 
trainings will be funded uh, because there are good trainings, but how to get them um, in place uh, quickly, if necessary, uh, that's uh, also a matter of money. Thank you. Um, and my question now would be to, to Rupert. Um, Rupert, we just uh, basically would like to hear also what um, role, what civil society role can be in sparkling the interest of other member states to set up their own units, and then how best you see the civil society can play a role also in transferring uh, the knowledge, best practices from countries like Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden, uh, to those countries which have just started the work or are about to start the work. So in a way, um, where can civil society play a role um, in this process? Well, the, uh, the NGOs, some of the NGOs who are, who are here today were involved probably 12 to 15 years ago in one of our earlier projects to help encourage the creation of some of these earlier specialized uh, war crimes prosecution units. And for civil society, they're absolutely critical because what it means is there's a, a line of connection where the professional relationship that was mentioned earlier can be developed and there's expertise developed within the investigation and prosecution services, which means that the it's, it's possible to get the views of victims directly into the legal process. So they're absolutely critical for an effective civil society role and to enhance the survivor experience as well. Uh, there are different ways, I think, that civil society can help this process. The first one is to do the research that is necessary. Now, obviously, those who are actually doing the work, whether investigators or prosecutors, can also do that. But quite often, we're able to connect with academic networks, with practitioner networks, uh, with individuals who can do that national legal research and comparative analysis that can set out what possibly needs to be changed in order to, to set up such a structure within each individual country. And that's incredibly useful. But the other thing that civil society can do is essentially make noise. And quite often it's quite difficult for prosecutors and investigators to sort of uh, say quite how much they should have in terms of resources. They can obviously put their applications in. But civil society can very much amplify that point in order to explain exactly why this needs to be done. And it's not just the, the police and the prosecutors saying that. We can tell you why that's relevant, bringing comparative examples from elsewhere. And I think the critical thing is to have the survivors a part of that conversation as well. It's all very well putting some criminal lawyer, uh, myself or one of my colleagues, to try and convince people to set up such institutions. But when you get people talking about how relevant it was with regard to other uh, criminal justice processes in the recent past, that's really powerful. And particularly when you're dealing with perhaps this needs to go through a political process, having that voice of survivors in the very process of how you structure criminal accountability in Europe, that's incredibly important as well. So all of these can be brought to bear to make sure that civil society can contribute to, to setting up these uh, new units and giving them some best practice to work from as well. Thank you very much, uh, Rupert, for these thoughts um, um, on the perspective of civil society. Um, I think uh, here we have also one comment in the chat from Dr. Stephanie Egger Urik. Um, she's a uh, head of one of the um, of one of the two German uh, war crimes unit on prosecutor level, saying that uh, she agrees that specialized units are very important. I'm very optimistic because a lot of young people are interested in international law. Uh, lawyer and forensics. So uh, that's nice to hear. I don't know whether it was just a comment or uh, if um, Dr. Stephanie um, uh, Egger Rurig would also like to pose a question, but I think uh, this is a good point that also there is an interest among uh, younger um, 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 population, younger people to, to, to look into, this, uh, into these aspects um, and join uh, work in these, in these uh, units. Um, of course, all the participants are involved um, or basically invited to share uh, questions or comments or to take uh, the floor. Just give us a, a sign and uh, we will be more than happy to give you the floor. Um, but one other question that would be, I think, very relevant uh, for all panelists, um, and that would be 
the role of the engagement of civil society in the global fight against impunity. Um, but what would be, in your view, the major development in cooperation between civil society actors and national authorities um, in the last uh, couple of years? That's another, I think, question that very much uh, resonates with the current situation in Ukraine, where we had, as we heard, a lot of civil society actors um, in the field. Uh, but what would you see as um, uh, the development, the progress in this cooperation uh, um, between civil society and national authorities? And uh, not to start with Gerard, we might uh, start this time uh, with Rina and then uh, Vincent, uh, Rupert and Gerard. Well, thank you. Well, I, in general, civil society plays, as mentioned here by so many uh, uh, previous speakers, a very important role. Uh, I mean, they are on the ground. They can gather evidence. They're the eyes and ears of national units. Um, well, they're not that, but, but they can um, provide evidence in a way that, that no one else can. Um, what I would like to say is that I think there's been a, a very rapid development of civil society organizations. Um, and and the, there's so many um, different ones. So I think there has been a, um, a development where we can see some playing very important roles for addressing accountability issues, uh, serving as, as uh, providers of evidence. Uh, but this is not for everyone. I, I think it's important to, to make a difference between what uh, a civil society organization aims to do and to have that dialogue between national units and civil society organizations uh, to make sure that if there is evidence that needs to be transferred or, or victims or cases built to, uh, to, to um, address national units, that, that this is done in communication with these specific units uh, to, to avoid uh, re-traumatization, um, taking statements. And I would say that there's been a, um, a massive understanding of, of the different roles that we play and, and, and these kind of uh, the communication between civil society uh, in, in, in our national jurisdictions, but also within the, the EU community. Um, Well, just to add a bit to that, um, uh, one of the dilemmas I am facing from a police perspective and uh, as an information collector, so to say, uh, is uh, always the question of uh, am I or is my team visible to the survivor or witness community or victim community? And if that answer is yes, which I don't know, uh, do they know we exist? Uh, do people know how to approach us? Um, um, are they willing to approach us? Uh, depending on where they come from, uh, depending on the background, uh, the existence of, a, of, a, of such, so such a mechanism might be completely unknown or distrusted because it's governmental. Um, so a role for civil society would actually be and it's, it's already there, um, be the, the, the gateway to police and or prosecution. Um, because I know there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people in the Netherlands that actually didn't find us. Um, and if they don't want to, that's fine. But if they're actually looking for some kind of um, uh, justice and accountability, uh, at least people should be able to report to the police if they are willing. Um, and I think there's quite a gap to fill. Many thanks. Uh, yeah, Rupert, please. Yeah, I think I was next. The, those are very good points, both of them. And, and to just build on the outreach to the survivor communities, that is obviously a crucial area where international NGOs can make links with national NGOs in different places. And, and with the Netherlands, that's taken place particularly with Rwanda. It's been explored for uh, Ethiopia and other trials. It's happened with regard to Liberia. And that ability to make that connection and make an introduction that otherwise would be completely unknown is really important um, when working on a global basis. And quite often, uh, particularly those large NGOs who have memberships all over the world, 
they can connect with their member organization and have those first meetings and and have that those national NGOs already have the confidence of the survivor groups and that brokering of that exchange with them and the international investigators coming from Europe can be incredibly helpful. So I think that's a very significant development as that's been built on in the last couple of years. I think another one to mention is uh, open source investigations, because I think there's been a huge amount of innovation over the last two or three years in the way that that is done, uh, particularly using technology, using quite sophisticated databases, the experience of, of uh, the various NGOs working uh, in and around Syria has just produced a vast amount of innovations with regard to the way that open source material is used. And even the way that uh, technology is used to present factual situations uh, to a courtroom standard. Those are, I, by the reports that we get from the trials that have taken place, have been immensely helpful to perhaps make what has gone on more understandable. And there's been uh, huge advances in the way that is done. So I think that will perhaps be something that's quite sig significant in the next couple of years as well. Thank you. Um, I think I'm the last for the for once, and uh, it's not the, the the best place by the by the way. Um, uh, to intervene uh, from a cooperation point of view, uh, I me I immediately uh, see two uh, role for partnership between the civil society and uh, cooperation authorities. Uh, first, uh, linked to. Uh, investigation and prosecution. When we send uh, mutual legal assistance requests to a state with uh, which we have no use to, to send requests, uh, civil society present on the field could help us to identify local authorities competent to receive and, and, and implement, execute the request, which is not always uh, easy to do. Uh, second, um, I we, we are seeing the extremely incredible role of the civil society in a project I was mentioning in my uh, introduction, which is the uh, MLA initiative, the project of a new treaty on uh, mutual legal assistance and extradition for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. The uh, civil society has been extremely useful to push for a speeding process. And uh, I must admit, we would not have been where we are without the civil society support. Thank you. Many thanks to, to all of you for addressing uh, this, this point on, on cooperation, civil society and improvements, of course, the developments um, on that. We have a question from, um, Julia Basile from, the, from France, and that uh, puts a bit more perspective of the ICC as well. Allow me to read it. Um, I will uh, read it in, in, in English for, for uh, it's, it's in French, but I will uh, write, uh, read it in English. So regarding the principle of complementarity, does the ICC seem to become a jurisdiction supporting national uh, countries, national jurisdictions that have opened investigations on the ground? and more specifically, of course, on Ukraine, and how to take into consideration the coordination on complementarity. Um, and uh, so a question into how ICC is, is supporting national jurisdictions and, of course, how to uh, coordinate uh, the, um, all the actors that work within the principle of complementarity. I will... Uh, Leave that. Uh, who would like to go first uh, with this one? Maybe Gerard. Uh, if I, I, may. I can, if you want. Um, relating to uh, who supports who, it depends. It depends on the case. That it depends on the situation. But I, I do not uh, see the situation as the ICC supporting the national authorities. The ICC has its own role to play when national jurisdictions have no capacity or uh, willingness to, to take action. Uh, it's not a super uh, uh, agency for judicial development, the ICC. It, it has to play its role of jurisdiction. 
uh, with regard to um, how to uh, play the partnership with regard to complementarity, I can give you one example. When the ICC, which is uh, the Belgium one, obviously, which I, I know the better, the best, sorry. Um, when the ICC is opening a new investigation, it sends an Article 18 a notification to all states' parties. And uh, that notification asks us if we have an uh, ongoing case in the situation in order not to duplicate the same uh, um, um, uh, investigations. When we answer, we always indicate that uh, if we have ongoing case, we are ready to uh, stop them at national level if the ICC wants to uh, prosecute itself. Um, and also we send information on relating cases, not especially cases follow, falling uh, under the jurisdiction of the court, but uh, which are uh, case interlinked with uh, the uh, investigation made by the court in order to offer them at, from the very beginning a maximum of information, judicial information, with regard to what they are uh, going to investigate. For instance, uh, a case on human trafficking, on uh, money laundering, etc. Who would uh, also like to address the issue on complementarity? And uh, Rina, would you yeah. please? I I could just say that no, I think it's an important question, of course, but, but this is, I don't think that at this moment we have structural investigations in many countries. We have, of course, uh, the national jurisdiction within Ukraine and we have the ICC. Um, as I see it, there is no ongoing competition. Uh, it's the other other half of, of the play. It's, it's, um, there is a need for coordination, definitely. Uh, but as I ha have understood, the, the ICC prosecutor, who has been very open about this, uh, there is a will and there is a need for cooperation uh, and coordination between the ICC and national jurisdictions. I do not see this as, as a big impediment or that this will cause a lot of um, uh, competitive uh, or conflicting interests because I, th I think there is the rules are quite clear of what a national jurisdiction can do, what Ukraine can do, and what the ICC, what kind of role ICC will have. Um, so, so I don't see this as a challenge, uh, more a question of administration. We need to find our way to, to be able to coordinate our different um, investigations. Thank you, Rina. Please, sir, Rupert. If I can add, there's a, a critical role here. Obviously, complementarity is essential if we're not just going to have trials of one or two people, but a much broader range of the true criminal, criminality of what took place. And so uh, in this particular point of active complementarity, there's a huge role for civil society. Uh, there's a limit, obviously, in terms of human resources to what the OTP can do, given the large number of countries where there are investigations and situations underway. Uh, but NGOs can play a huge role in this. Um, they can be critical in pushing for national accountability, both at the national level and at the international level. They can provide expertise uh, for the OTP in what happened, provide the experts, provide the uh, connections for who needs to be spoken with. They can really push for national legal reform in order to facilitate cooperation with the International Criminal Court. They can connect with survivor groups to individual communities around the country and in particular areas. Um, most importantly, they can keep the narrative for accountability in the public domain, quite often during the fairly long periods where investigations by their nature have to be confidential and not much can be said. And that's really important to keep that energy going in the campaign. Um, and they can also explain what's going on in a way that sometimes can't be done um, when that confidentiality is in place. And if, if you think about how that's happened recently in Sudan, there's been a, a strong Sudanese civil society network that's been in place supporting the ICC and keeping the narrative going, pushing for legal reforms, which were going very well until the recent coup uh, pushed back to some extent or, or significantly. They have also been engaging with survivor groups and they have been observing the trials and reporting back on what's been going on. 
Similarly, in Ukraine, civ Ukrainian civil society has been incredibly active since 2014 in pushing for national legal reform for what needs to be done in Ukraine for there to be active complementarity. And that uh, activism is still ongoing in order to encourage the Ukrainian government to put in place the legal steps that will be necessary uh, for that to work uh, as effectively as needs be. So yes, uh, to ensure that complementarity is real on the ground rather than just a, a promise has a really strong role for civil society to play as part of that process. Many thanks uh, for, for responding to, to this question. Um, I see we have uh, two more uh, questions and one is uh, in a way related from, uh, one is from uh, a magistrate in Cameroon um, asking whether there should be um, sort of a contact points um, in, in, in all the national jurisdiction who are um, dealing with, well, who are uh, kind of implementing the principle of complementarity. So fo focusing from the I ICC perspective, but of course, maybe if we transform this question in the following. So we have EU genocide network. Um, do you see that similar networks could be set up in other regions um, either with the ICC and, and the principle of complementarity support or on their own? And what would be the value of such networks in other regions? And the second, uh, well, the second question is, is relating to, to Syria situation. Um, and, uh, and basically that, uh, of course, for civil society actors, it's from Mazen Darvish. Um, and uh, I'm very happy, Mazen, you're with us uh, today during this discussion. Um, and the question from him is that um, procedures differ from one country to another, so national procedures. So how could civil society have best practices um, on uh, dealing with particular country? And I think, uh, Rupert, you, you address this in a way uh, by these guidelines, manuals that are set up on that. And of course, um, um, what are uh, that there's potential that suspects of war crimes in Ukraine are the same as uh, those who have been involved in war crimes in Syria, and whether there is a vision for dealing uh, with these cases. So, few que few cash questions. Um, think um, um, who would like to um, address um, um, each, but maybe the one, the first one on the setting up of similar regional networks in, in other uh, continents or regions, um, and, and then second one on um, dealing with different judicial procedures and connection of, of war crimes between Syria and Ukraine. Um, maybe, uh, Rupert, can we go with you uh, first to address these uh, questions, and then we'll follow with Vincent, Rina, and Gerard. Certainly on the question of regional cooperation, of course, there is huge experience in universal jurisdiction prosecutions and successful trials in Latin America. And one of the, I mean, I think there was a report done recently that there have been a couple of hundred trials, I think, overall, if you count them in a certain way. But the information and the legal expertise and the legal decisions and the complex procedural questions they've resolved, all of these issues are not that well known in Europe. And when we looked at it a few years ago, I think the sad re reason for it was that almost all the law is only in Spanish. And uh, curiously, that linguistic limitation has meant that the experience, the vast experience that's taken place in those countries has not yet been properly shared with practitioners elsewhere. And so I think there is a, a real um, thing that could be done to make sure that that experience doesn't go unheeded. And we try and make the links that are relevant. Obviously, it's not applicable directly, but some of those links would be very uh, impressively made. And so, as I understand it, there are some quite good informal networks between the various prosecution authorities in Latin America. And certainly civil society work on those cases does engage uh, together in, in a networked way, in a very uh, organized way. And some of the NGOs participating on this call, call also work there. The situation in Africa is, is unfortunately less coordinated. Um, particularly due to the, the, the lack of a significant number of universal jurisdiction trials. But obviously, again, you have some really interesting examples that have taken place there with the Hissan Habre trial under uh, an extraordinary African chambers in the courts of Senegal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, domestic trials uh, likely to take place, uh, that did take place in Rwanda, possible trials in places uh, such as the Gambia. So there are good examples, but it doesn't seem to be quite so coordinated. But I think there is a, a real demand for 
for better coordination with regard to international crimes cases across the African continent. Um, and then um, Mazen's point is very helpful, I think, on, on this is one of the critical things I think that many NGOs do find is that it's the actual practice of how it works that is often difficult to ascertain. Uh, the publications that uh, our colleagues at Trial International and the Open Society Justice Initiative have put out on these uh, nine or ten different countries give you the legal steps uh, and uh, as much as possible they have tried to give a good impression of the practice by speaking to practitioners and prosecutors to say how it actually works and how they like to apply it. But of course there are often subtleties in any domestic legal system that quite often it's only 20 years of practice mean that you really understand the subtleties of how it works. And so I think probably the only real way to do that is by connecting uh, national NGOs, such as Mars and working on Syria, with uh, national practitioners, either, either the national prosecutors and, and, and investigators, or with criminal justice experts from each individual country. Um, because uh, that, that's often what we find is the key crunch. You need to know how the law works in practice in order to be able to give that kind of nuanced advice, which is often the most tactically important. Um, thank you. Um, I'm trying to find any significant addition to what already has been said. Um, first uh, question about um, um, uh, the original approach. I completely agree with, uh, with uh, um, the former speaker. Um, local cooperation is key. Uh, and then again, interregional cooperation can be really useful because the Latin American example uh, it's a really good one. Um, we we should uh, connect to that. Um, uh, then the question uh, regarding the, 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 all the different procedures. Well, very simple from a police perspective. Um, I would like to provide a survivor or a victim with a clear roadmap. Um, so if you enter Europe to uh, stay with the regional approach, um, you should have some kind of menu where you can pick from. Well, I'm in country A, what are my options? A, B, C, D. And then you can uh, uh, weigh it, make it more easy to, to, to have some access to justice um, because it's, it's, it's completely correct. Uh, all the procedures differ uh, from the first stage to the last stage. Uh, but I don't think it should be too complicated to, uh, to create some kind of roadmap. Um, I want to report a crime. Um, how do I do it? Um, uh, whether it's the, making the connection with civil society, police or prosecution. What can I add? Well, when, just to the last question, I also think it's important to add that not only to link local NGOs, uh, like, like Mazen Darwish, one from Syria, to, to prosecutors and police, of course, this is good, but also that the NGOs already established in one country can have a, a connection with with those local NGOs. I think that's a, this is something that has worked very well in Sweden, and and how we can see that that local established NGOs in Sweden are connecting to uh, to local NGOs in, in in conflict zones, and by doing so, reaching out and and sharing how in Sweden one would go about to to, uh, to give evidence uh, to to police or prosecutor. Um, when it comes to the regional uh, cooperation, I, I can only agree. I think this is very important. And even though we cannot always speak about those large-scale reg regional efforts, I think it's important to at least if we could have a few countries that would begin with some sort of regional, co regional coordination, I think that's a step on the way and then slowly adding on. Um, with more countries being interested, I think that could, could work both for, for Africa, but also for Latin America. And I also agree with, with the question of interpretation, because when it comes to universal jurisdiction, uh, it is of interest, basically everyone, on how different courts in different countries have interpreted uh, international customary laws. So I think there is definitely a need for, for a broader exchange in these matters as well. From my part, uh, I will focus on the question of creation of um, other regional um, network, genocide network, like uh, the European one. Uh, obviously, when you see the incredible Im impact of the creation of the European genocide network on the fight against impunity, uh, it's uh, 
more than usefulness, it's a necessity to uh, create uh, similar network uh, in other region uh, through all over the world. Um, what I would uh, underline uh, with this um, is the necessity to establish a secretariat. Uh, Mateusz, you know, I'm one of the ancient members of the, of the network. I was already there where we had no secretariat. It was extremely difficult to survive. Uh, we had uh, no systematic meeting uh, every semester. It was depending from the presidency, European presidency. And once through, uh, at the time of the Belgian presidency, we trigger the establishment of a secretariat and the secretariat was established, it changed the world because you have then a permanence, a permanent organ organizing meetings, being the memory, being the uh, triggering of, of uh, ideas, uh, the one to uh, listen uh, every day uh, on necessary, necessary action to be taken. Uh, etc so i think what is what could be very important is that those new regional um network would be linked to a regional existing regional organization with some budget and capacity to establish a secretariat you are a key player Matthias. you know that luckily it's a institution so it's a secretariat it's not the person so that's a collective memory and institutionalized uh, structure. Uh, but I uh, appreciate your kind words. Um, before we conclude, I would just have um, another last question. And that is in relation to what we have discussed today and looking into situation in Ukraine. In your view, what would be main challenge for EU and member states in relation to properly address accountability in Ukraine. So if we look now into the um, your experience and, and uh, a link to the past conflict and situation of human rights violation, let's look into the ongoing situation and of course the future. What do you see as the main challenge, both for the EU and member states? Perhaps I can suggest uh, Vincent, Rina, Rupert, and Gerard, if we take it in this order. Well, there, there are many challenges, but one I see, and maybe it's not the biggest one, but I don't know, um, is that I think it's not a problem of collecting information. It's not a problem of having it stored or analyzed. In the end, I think, it's even not an issue of investigating, um, but how to actually arrest perpetrators on the long run. So we can put a lot of effort and we should put a lot of effort in every form of cooperation and support of um, investigating a prosecution crimes being committed right now, but that's not, and it should not be the end of the story. So, um, uh, and the same goes for some other conflicts, how to, in the end, arrest a suspect. One challenge, but I leave a lot of room for other challenges to be mentioned by my uh, colleagues. Um, of course, there are many challenges, um, coordination being one key one, and I think Vincent addressed a, a very important one, but I, I would still like to stress on, on the successes, uh, the fact that the response of what has happened in Ukraine has been enormous, the fact that we have a national jurisdiction that can act, that are acting already to address these offences, that we have so many countries that are uh, looking into starting units, uh, starting investigations, that we have units that are willing to help to address these questions, and we have the ICC and, and also Eurojust and the Genocide Network. Um, I think it's a momentum today uh, where we are, and, and I think even though there are challenges, I think we should focus on, on, on the achievements and where we are and the reasons, I think, uh, that a lot of the efforts that have been made in these last two months 
have been so efficient and, and so quickly addressed, I, I think that has to do with the fact that this, these, were, these issues were already on the table. We had functioning units, we had the genocide network, we had Eurojust, we had the ICC. Um, so I, I would rather focus on the positive side, if any, if one can talk about positive uh, things uh, in, in time like these. Thanks. I think there are lots of the practical uh, hurdles that we have been discussing this afternoon. And I think if we can improve our response to those over time, we'll make it easier to bring more perpetrators to justice and perhaps by better uh, and more detailed investigations of the command structures of who is involved, it may make it easier to arrest a broader range of people uh, compared with just the, the, f the handful who may be found within jurisdictions. I think there is sort of trying to think slightly broader. There is one issue that for many civil society groups is of concern, is that is the potential perception of double standards in that on occasion, as prosecutions become more frequent, there will be pressure to prosecute certain types of crimes and not others. And I think it's incredibly important that prosecution is done in, in a very fair and open-handed way, but also means investigating ourselves, if I can put it that way, when crimes take place that uh, are deserving of investigations under human rights law, and to maintain credibility of the independence and impartiality of the way uh, that we prosecute offences in Europe, as more of it happens, it may be important to look at that side of things as well. For my part, I would like to underline perhaps uh, three points. First, one challenge is the massive commission of crimes. It will raise, obviously, uh, material difficulties to investigate every single crime. Um, and that, even if we have that uh, incredible um, uh, action uh, in a lot of European countries, uh, trying to investigate themselves or to uh, help cooperate with uh, the belligerent uh, authorities. Uh, second, um, we have to, as Rupert said, but perhaps on, on another angle, to, we have to be impartial and to investigate all crimes, whatever the belligerent is the uh, suspect of having committed them. Uh, it's clear now that most of the crimes are committed by one side, but uh, we have not to forget to investigate both sides, so, to be fair. And um, lastly, we will face what seems to be the in unwillingness of one belligerent to investigate any crimes committed by and that will be another challenge. Many thanks for this uh, um, thought and, uh, and basically very, very honest assessment on, on, on this. As you know, Eurojust is supporting a JIT um, in relation to the situation in Ukraine. Um, and that is still very much all under discussion and, and details that needs to be finalized and, and, and worked and so on. Um, so some thoughts that, uh, of course, help us a great deal in assessing also um, what the challenges will be and how to address them. With this uh, rich discussion, um, and uh, really um, would like to, to thank you, um, the panelists, for your participation, for your contribution. It has been really the, this uh, seventh EU Day Against Impunity um, with your thoughts and uh, bringing in your expertise, your knowledge, I think that really helped us um, in identifying a way uh, forward, how to improve. And of course, what I can say from Secretariat point of view is that uh, by looking at the implementation and today's report on the level of the EU, um, on, on, on to address accountability, our work has not uh, finished here. But we will actually look into sort of producing strategy 2.0 into what are those measures that could improve the capacity on national level and EU. So on one side that can improve or those measures that have not been properly implemented in all EU states to really um, work further 
on um, bringing your expertise or your um, um, experiences and share that further with others. I would also like to remind uh, all uh, participants, of course, that the video has been uh, recorded, that it will be edited and later on published also on Eurojust uh, YouTube channel. For those who have uh, joined us from uh, French-speaking uh, countries, please know that uh, French subtitles will be available as well. So um, what has been said today in English, you will be able to read in, in French in a few days. So uh, with that being said, I would like to thank all of you and again to all the four panelists uh, for this discussion and to all who have joined us today on marking the seventh EU Day Against Impunity. And of course, we'll continue from the Secretariat point of view, we will continue to fight impunity to our best, um, uh, the best we can. Um, and of course, uh, work towards the eighth EU Day Against Impunity that we will mark next year. Thank you very much. And I wish you a pleasant afternoon. Goodbye.